Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today, continuing on our immigration and urbanization type, the growth of America in the late 1800s, continuing on with section four. Um, so, um, Red alert, red alert. Uh, this is a, a very lengthy lecture. I tried my best to shorten it to where there's not a lot of writing, but there are some important things. So just a forewarning, this lecture video could be very long. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys um it was a long it was a long section in your in your textbook as well so you know don't at me in the comments please but here we go on to chapter three lesson four urbanization and social reform uh that was your warm-up Okay, students will be able to objectives describe living and working conditions of people's lives in the cities Differentiate the problems urbanization brought about by the corruption of government officials and investigate Gilded Age ideas brought forth to society. All right, city life. Let's get it started in the city. Most of the immigrants who arrived in the United States were in the late 1800s where the nation were lived in the nation's growing cities and took the jobs in the rapidly expanding factories. At the same time, rural Americans began moving to the cities for better paying jobs. Cities had a lot to offer, electric lights, running water, modern plumbing, plus attractions like museums, libraries, and theaters. In New York City, had about 800,000 people at the beginning before the Civil War, 1860, and they grew to almost 3.5 million in 40 years. That's a lot of people. Chico, that should be Chicago. Chicago swelled from 109,000 people to one to more than 1.6 million in that same time period. So by the 1920s, still can't get over that. By the 1920s, more Americans lived in urban areas than in rural areas. All right, mass transit. As populations grew, the rising value of land provide an incentive to try new strategies of urban development. So businessmen decided to build upward and not outward. Aided by the invention of the safety elevator, tall steel frame buildings called skyscrapers began to appear. Increasing population density will also lead to the development of various kinds of mass transit. So you have horse cars, which are railroad cars pulled by horses, in San Francisco installed cable cars in 1873. And in 1877, uh, a guy named Sprague, Sprague invented the electric trolley car. The largest cities will still have to deal with congestion. So in Chicago, they decide to build elevated railroads while in Boston and New York, the first subway system started to appear. So on the left is the railroad, the, the horse car, obviously being pulled by horses. And there you got the trolley car, San Francisco Railroad, or is that Clay St. Hill Railroad? That's a trolley car. Here's uh, Chicago with the elevated railroad. And when I think of Chicago, I think, oh, look, Shameless. Who watches Shameless? <laughs> they call that i believe that's called the l the l train so there you go and then here's subways in new york and boston there are also lots of pictures in this um lecture video during the last half of the 1800s the wealthiest families established fashionable districts in the heart of the city as their homes grew larger wealthy women increasingly relied on more servants such as cooks, maids, butlers, nannies, and chauffeurs, and they'll spend a great deal of money on social activities. Wealthy women had more time to pursue activities outside the home, including 
women's clubs. At first, they focused on so the social and educational activities, but over time, club women got involved in charitable and reform activities. American industrialization will also expand the middle class, such as doctors, lawyers, engineers, managers, social workers, architects, and teachers. Many middle-class people will leave the central city to escape crime and pollution to afford larger homes. Some of these use commuter rail lines that move to the streetcar suburbs. How convenient. Uh, here's a, the founders of the Chicago Women's Club. There you go. Thank you, ladies. Work. A uh, few urban worker class families could even hope to own a home. Most spent their lives in crowded tenements. Tenements, test question. Tenements were multifamily apartment buildings. Even with the working class, some people were better off than others. White native born men earned higher wages than African Americans, immigrants, and women. In some cases, the entire family worked, even children, much like the Industrial Revolution in Europe. They were, there were dangerous working conditions and the, due to the dangerous working conditions and the fact children weren't in school will alarm many, many reformers. More women will take jobs outside the home. White native born women were better educated than others and found jobs as teachers, clerks, or secretaries. Many women were also domestic servants. Immigrants worked as servants in the North and of course, African-Americans, African-American women, were servants in the South. Uh, here's a grimy picture of a tenement. I wonder how many people can you see? Can you find? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, just in the picture. Here are servants, maids. All right, my middle name is crime. No crime, no pay. Where we are here in the Bay. Anyways, it's on your nicotine song. So crime was a growing problem in America. Minor criminals like pickpockets, swindlers, and thieves thrived in crowded urban environments. Major crimes will multiply as well. So from 1880 to 1900, the murder rate jumped sharply from 25 per million murders to more than 100 per million murders. People... Uh, in debt, you know. Disease and pollution will prove to be even bigger threats. Improper sewage disposal, contaminated city drinking water, and triggered epidemics of typhoid, fever, and cholera. Horse manure would be left in the streets, chimneys belched out smoke, and soot built up from coal or wood fires. So, you know, those aren't, those aren't good for the environment. Political machines, which are informal... Uh, an informal political group designed to gain and keep power developed because cities grew much faster than their governments. And new, new city dwellers needed jobs, housing, food, heat, and police protection. So who are they going to go to? The political machines. So here's some congestion of Hester Street in New York City. Here's a political machine handing out special privilege. What does it say? Finances. Immunity from arrest. That's what a party boss can do. All right, political corruption. Uh, this whole, this slide is a test question or parts of test questions, multiple test questions. In exchange for votes, political machines, carrying on from the last slide, political machines and their party bosses eagerly provided those necessities. George Plunkett, one of New York City's biggest party bosses, defended the benefits of party bosses. Party bosses also controlled the city's finances. And many party bosses will grow rich through fraud or graft. What is graft? Gaining money or power illegally. Party bosses accepted bribes from contractors who were supposed to compete fairly for contracts to build streets, sewers, and buildings. Corrupt bosses sold permits to their friends to operate public utilities. So you have Tammany Hall, New York City's largest political machine, was one of the most infamous of these organizations. 
You have William Boss Tweed was their famous leader during the late 1860s and 1870s. His corruption will lead to a prison sentence given to him in 1874. Cartoonist Thomas Nast will heavily blast corrupt political machines in the papers. Defenders of political machines argue that they provided necessary services that helped uh, newcomers assimilate easier to the city. So here you have Mr. Plunkett on the left, Boss Tweed on the right, and this is a picture of Tammany Hall. It's not a person, it's just called Tammany Hall. All right. Um, here's Thomas Nast on the left, and here are his political cartoon of a police officer picking up, you know, a small criminal, and he's barely able to reach to, again, a fat political party boss. Like, good luck trying to arrest that guy. Am I right? All right, gassing me up. So uh, Mark Twain and Charles Warner will write the novel The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. Historians later adopted the term for the, this time period, um, The Gilded Age from 1870 to 1900. It was a time of marvels in many ways. There are many amazing new inventions will lead to rapid industrial growth. Cities grew in size and wealthy entrepreneurs built spectacular mansions. Skyscrapers reached the sky and electric lights banished darkness. But the name came as a warning. So gilded items, might appear wonderful because they're covered in gold, but they're made of cheap materials inside. So while it might appear wonderful, the Gilded Age still hides corruption, poverty, crime, and the inequality between the rich and the poor. The strongest beliefs of the era was something called individualism. So, no matter a person's humble beginnings, a person could rise through society with their talents and commitment. You have a guy named Horatio Alger, and he'll write over a hundred rags to riches stories that will motivate young people uh, that no matter how many obstacles they faced in their lives, success in life was still possible. He's a glass half empty kind of guy. Love it. Here's uh, Mark Twain's book. The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. All right, God's plan. Test question, social Darwinism. Another powerful idea that came from this era was called social Darwinism. Loosely derived from Darwin's theories, uh, will heavily, strongly influence, um, reinforce individualism. Remember, Darwin's book argued that plant and animal life had evolved over millions of years through natural selection. The species that could adapt, couldn't adapt will die out. And while those that did live on pass on their adaptations to their descendants. So British philosopher Herbert Spencer, not Darwin, not Charles Darwin, applied Darwin's theory of evolution to society. And that's called social Darwinism. He argued that society evolved through competition and natural selection, the survival of the fittest example so seeing this being proposed to society industrial leaders use social darwinism to justify their support for laissez-faire capitalism devout christians found darwin's conclusions however to be offensive they rejected darwin's accounts because it contradicted what the bible had said some clergy said that darwin's theory was god's way of creating the world so a man named Henry Beecher, Henry Ward Beecher, who defended that, um, called himself a Christian evolutionist. That's Herbert Spencer. We rich, rich. All right, we, we, we've learned about Andrew Carnegie. And he will advocate for a gentler version of social Darwinism, Darwinism which he called the gospel of wealth. And he said... Americans should engage in philanthropy, which is using their fortunes to create conditions that would help people help themselves. So building hospitals, museums, 
schools, etc. Carnegie funded the creation of the public libraries because he believed the libraries provided resources people needed to succeed. His ideas were greatly received by America's wealthy people. During the late 1800s, many people were very, very, there were many people who were very, very rich. And it was also a great era for philanthropy. So Rockefeller refined, found the University of Chicago. Likewise, other very rich entrepreneurs like Stanford, Vanderbilt, and Johns Hopkins were all uh, named by these colleges of Stanford, Vanderbilt, and Johns Hopkins were all named after the wealthy people who found them. So on the left, you have the Stanford family. Uh, and that's the Stanford logo. Cornelius Vanderbilt, that's the Vanderbilt logo. University of Chicago, this is Rockefeller walking right here. Um, and I believe this, when I looked up this picture, it's like the first graduation. And then this is Johns Hopkins. All right, a challenger approaches. So in 1880, Henry George will publish a book called Progress and Poverty, a discussion of the American economy that quickly became a bestseller. George observed that the increase in wealth driven by industrialization should have eliminated poverty. But he claimed, quote, the gulf between the employed and the employer is growing wider. Social contracts are becoming, social contrasts are becoming sharper. And he argued that laissez-faire, hands-off economics was making society worse. But most economists now argue that George's analysis was flawed. Industrialism did make some Americans very wealthy, but it also approved, improved the standard of living for most others. But Americans in poverty at the time didn't see improvement. So George's ideas will lead form reformers to challenge the ideas of social Darwinism. Okay, more writing. That's not a pun. Um, in 1883, a man named Lester Frank Ward published Dynamic Sociology, where he argued that humans were different from animals because they could, they could make plans too and produce the outcomes they desired. That's how we're different from animals, not these opposable thumbs. His ideas became known as reform Darwinism. He, Lester Frank Ward, argued that governments could regulate the economy, cure poverty, and promote education more efficiently than competition in the marketplace could. That's a nice thought. Um, you have a guy named Edward Bellamy. He will publish a book called Looking Backward, a novel about a man who fell asleep in 1887 and wakes up in the year 2000 to find that the nation has become a perfect society with no crime, poverty, or politics. In this fictional society, the government owns all the industry and shares the wealth equally with all Americans. Basically a form of socialism. And I, I kind of want to read this book and see what they said about 2000. Your boy was alive during that time. I want to know. Uh, here's Lester Frank Ward and his book. Nature. Nature writing. So there's a new style of writing became known as naturalism, which will criticize industrial society. Challenged by social Darwinism, they challenged social Darwinism by suggesting that some people failed because they were just caught up in circumstances out of their control. So prominent natural, naturalists were Stephen Crane, Jack London, Theodore Dreiser. Crane's novel, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, told the story of Maggie, whose efforts to improve her life failed. London's tales of the Alaskan wilderness demonstrated the power of nature over civilization. Dreiser's novels, such as Sister Carrie, painted a world where people sinned without punishment and where pursuit of wealth and power was often destroying their character. Naturalist literature encouraged some people to become reformers too, to help the less fortunate. But it downplayed the ability of people to make a difference through action and encourage resentment towards people in different social classes. This literature will implicitly ask readers to consider whether individualism and laissez-faire was leading to the best possible society.
readers might conclude that the government intervention was the way to make things better. You know, have the government step in. Oh my gosh. I said, young man. I said, young man. Anyways, uh, so the social gospel movement will work to help the urban poor according to biblical ideas of charity and justice. You have a guy named Washington Gladden, a minister. It was an early advocate who popularized a movement called in his book called Applied Christianity. You have another man named Walter Ro Rosh 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 a Baptist minister from New York, say that five times fast, became the leading voice of the social gospel movement, which inspired many churches to build gyms, provide social programs and child care, and to help the poor. So two companies, two organizations that you might be familiar with are the Salvation Army and the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, will combine faith and reform. Salvation Army offered practical aid and religious counseling to the urban poor. The YMCA tried to help build help industrial workers in urban poor by organizing Bible studies, citizenship training, and group activities. They also provide low-cost boarding houses for young men. That's where I uh, played some basketball growing up, is at the Y. So, you know, the famous song made by the YMCA, The Village People. Uh, that's the logo today, the YMCA and the Salvation Army. Doing the most good. Doing the most. All right, femininity, Femini femininity, geez, I can't speak. The settlement house movement began as an offshoot to the social gospel movement. Idealistic reformers, including many college educated women, established settlement houses in poor neighborhoods, often with large immigrant populations. Reformers lived in these settlement houses, were, were, which were community centers, <coughs> offering everything from medical care and English classes to kindergartens and recreational programs. These houses became communities that allowed the idea of family and feminine identity, I spelled that wrong, to expand its identity. Uh, they provided a space to help these women advocate for their progressive ideals. Uh, one such famous woman, Jane Adams, opened the whole house in 1889 in Chicago with her partner, Ellen Starr. Jewish reformer Lillian Wald founded the Henry Street Settlement House in New York City. And there's Jane Adams and the whole house. She, she gets a lot of good um, publicity for this. School back then. So industrial America needed uh, more trained and educated workers. The number of children in school more than doubled from 1870 to 1900. About so about 7.5 million people, 7.5 million children to 1900. Uh, I looked it up last night. There are, there were in 2021, 43.5 million children, or was it? No, it was 49, 49 and a half million kids enrolled in public education in 2021. So there you go. Public schools were often crucial to the success of immigrant children. At school, they were taught English and American history and culture, a process known as Americanization. Schools will also try to instill discipline. Grammar schools were divided, divided students into grades and gr drilled them on punctuality, neatness, and efficiency, necessary habits for the workplace. Vocational education taught skills required for specific trades. Children in cities had greater access to education than those in rural ones. Most African-Americans, however, were segregated into underfunded schools. Some African-Americans decided to start their own schools following the example of Booker T. Washington, who founded the Tuskegee Institute in 1881. There's Booker T. and Tuskegee. Paintings and books. So a new movement in art and literature was called realism in the late 1800s. Just as Darwin tried to explain the natural world scientifically, artists and writers tried to portray the world realistically. Realist painters paint, realist artists painted real people doing ordinary things. Thomas Edison 
painted men rowing, athletes playing baseball, a family out in a carriage ride, doctors performing surgery. I don't know how about that one. Or scientists in their laboratories. <laughs> These paintings captured the era's social relationships, the differences between the social classes and the way people looked doing ordinary things in life. <coughs> Writers attempted to capture the world as they saw it. Mark Twain, his real name is Samuel Clemens, published his masterpiece, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in 1884. The title character, Huckleberry Finn, and his friend Jim, who escaped slavery, float down the Mississippi River on a raft, and they will come into various encounters with people and i mean let's be honest i read that book in sixth grade so it's a very long time ago mark twain gave readers a humorous yet critical account of racism violence and poverty there he is mark twain huckleberry finn all right the fun times so the improved standard of living enabled many people to spend their money on entertainment and recreation. Working class families and single adults could find entertainment at new amusement parks such as New York City's Coney Island. They had amusement rides like water slides, railroad rides <coughs> that only cost a nickel and a dime bars. People also began to watch professional sports as a source, as a source of entertainment. The first pro baseball team were the Cincinnati Red Stockings, or the Cincinnati Reds. The first World Series was played between the Boston Americans and the Pittsburgh Pirates. And football began to become a popular sport by the late 1800s, which had soon spread to colleges. So here's a picture of Coney Island. The first team picture of the Cincinnati Red Stockings on the right, and down here, the World Series, music. So people enjoyed comic, theater, and music. They uh, adapted from the French theater. Vaudeville will take on American flavor in the 1800s. The hodgepodge of animal acts, singers, comedians, acrobats, and dancers will um, entertain people. Like vaudeville, Ragtime music, a new form of music in the late 1800s, ragtime music echoed the hectic pace of city life. Its syncopated rhythms grew out of the music of Riverside Honky Tonk Saloon, pianists and banjo players using patterns of African-American music. Scott Joplin, one of the most famous African-American ragtime composers became known as the King of Ragtime. <coughs> and his famous song was the Maple Leaf Rag in 1899. And there's Scott Joplin. And wouldn't you know, that's the end of the lecture. And wouldn't you know, I don't have the book in front of me. Hold on. Hold on. I didn't leave you. Jeez. All right. So, sorry about that. I should really have the textbook right next to me. Um, but the your homework is page 162, two through four. So, I know it was a little bit longer. There was a lot of stuff to cover, but hopefully you guys did enjoy that. Um, like I said, I was trying to, you know, decrease the number of slides, the number of stuff you guys need to write. So hopefully you guys did enjoy. If you did, make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.